apologies of absence because the three of us are here, yes. Yes, um, the only apology we have, which, which we don't normally record, but it's just to let you know that Mark Rogers is unable to attend this morning. Oh, thank you, Jane. Um, do we have any declarations of interest? No. No. Fantastic. OK, so if we just move on to item three then, so welcome to um, to Ricky Dibble, um, the station commander um, for the um, Scottish Fire and Rescue performance report. If I can hand over to you, Ricky, that would be great. That's great, Chair. Yeah, thank you. And hello, everyone. I think I've, I've met most of you at some point or other, but yeah. uh, it's nice to be. Hopefully we'll get back to face to face meetings soon. Uh, and I'll do a quick apology to Dot because a lot of what I say, going to say just now she probably heard yesterday at the Dingwall meeting, so it's, it's repetition <laughs> for her. But you've obviously all seen the report I sent out to you, so I wasn't intending to to read through it. There's nothing hugely concerning or jumping out of it, so I think I'll start by just opening up for questions. Has anybody got any questions in regards to the content of the report? Yeah, I have I have a wee bit of commentary as it were. Um, yep. I think first of all, thank you very much for the report. It was very comprehensive and very detailed, and I appreciate the work that would have gone into that. Um, I was going to say it was very reassuring to see that there'd been um no fatalities from dwelling fires, and that there had been um no non-fatal casualties from fire this year. And I think those were both very reassuring figures. Um. I think, however, the, the contrast to that reassurance was seeing that perhaps um, recruitment of firefighters is perhaps posing difficult in the Cromarty and Fortress areas. So I was wondering if you perhaps wanted to comment on recruitment. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, was, I was going to come to that anyway. In, in the Black Isle, we were served with both Cromarty and Fortress stations. Cromarty is a community response unit, which is essentially a volunteer unit. Uh, at the moment, I'm sitting there with eight staff, six, six, six gents and two females, uh, which is a good number for that station. If I have any more people applying, I would look to get them in there, but eight's a good number for what they do. They are very, they're kind of limited in what they respond to. I don't know if you've actually been to the station or not, and I'd be more than happy if you want to come and have a visit and a look around. The crew themselves are the most committed and enthusiastic bunch you'll ever meet. Uh, I don't know if you're aware, they did a, a Halloween party at the station where they decorate the station. They were all dressed up and I think it was about 140 odd kids came through. It was fantastic. They're really community, community orientated and a really good bunch. For Trolls is uh, an on-call station. We're, we're changing the terminology now from retained, which I keep talking about because I've done it for 28 years. It's taken a wee bit getting used to but we're now looking to promote them as on-call firefighters. We've had an, an awful lot of challenges in for trolls. At the minute, I've got a crew of five there, which is, is quite tight, and that's reflected in the percentage of availability. I think we were looking at 49.45% for that reporting period. I just had a retirement at that point, uh, and I had one in long-term six has now come back, but we're still really tight in numbers. We've tried desperately, the crew have worked really, really hard to recruit. And we had a couple of open day, an open day and an open night in June. And from that, we've actually picked up three individuals. One who is in the second week of his training course this week at Inver Gordon, which is really good. And we have another two in the system that will hopefully get in towards the end of this year and start of next year, which will put the numbers up a little bit. But it, takes a little bit of time when people join before we can get them up to running on the machine properly and through their BA courses. And it's down to there's two two blocks of two 10 days training we have to get through, which is a big ask. Uh, for trolls has been exceptionally challenging since 2018. I think I've lost approximately seven firefighters through retirements and change of jobs and things. So it's, it's been a an extraordinary turnover of staff and we must have interviewed over that period about probably about a dozen people but for various reasons they haven't been able to commit or they haven't got through the, the application process or they've moved away so 
although we've been battling constantly to get people in, we are struggling to crew for troll station. In terms of fire cover, you know, we will always respond to fire because we'll back up from Inverness or Dingwall or whatever we need to, but the crew at patrols themselves are very frustrated that we can't get people in. And when we get people, we have no method of fast tracking them to get them to sit in the plants. They have to go through the training and the time that takes. And the, the, the service as a whole, we put so much effort into recruitment. It's, it's just incredible. It's a constant ongoing thing. We're trying to make it slicker. But you've possibly seen over the last, certainly over the weekend, there was a lot of bad press about lack of availability, particularly up in the Caithness and Sutherland areas. It's a huge challenge up there. We have we have people who can't commit during the day. So we have we have numerous stations off during the day. We've put in all sorts of, of measures to to backfill stations. If we've got a, a glut of firefighters at one station, we could maybe take a driver or someone and put into another station to get pumps to run. We'll try and everything we possibly can, but there's, there's no hiding from the fact that recruitment is very, very challenging because of what we commit. But the service is doing everything we possibly can, and we will always respond. If it's not the, if it's not the local station that will respond, the next nearest one will come. So I, I can and, rest. Can I ask you a question on that? That um, I'm aware that there is the the ballot for industrial auction within the fire service at the moment. Yes. Do you know? where that sits and what the impact might be for fire cover in the area. Yeah, well, you're, you're stealing all my thunder here. I was just coming to that. that oh, was, sorry. <laughs> the, they've done a consultative ballot which came through last night, yesterday, that they have rejected the 5% the pay deal, which seems to be standard across the country at the moment. There's an awful lot going on. We, as a manager, we've been sort of hit crisis mode at the weekend for planning. We're trying to plan desperately how are we going to deal with industrial action. At the moment, it's a consultative ballot to see if they're going to ballot properly for industrial action, but they had approximately an 80% turnout and it was virtually, I think it was a 79% of the 80% voting to reject it. So the, the, the feeling is very strong. You have to bear in mind, this is a, a national, this is a national pay deal. It's not Scotland. This is Big and we're very much influenced through sort of England and the big Met brigades down there. So, in terms of industrial action, it depends on what we go. It's slightly different because we work with on call stations up here that they don't man the station 24 7. So, if, for example, industrial action was we're going to work to rule, we'll only answer the emergency calls. Apart from the training side of things and maybe some of the, the prevention, school visits, home fire safety visits, that wouldn't really impact on fire cover in the area because the crews would respond as they normally do. We just don't know where it's going to go. Not everybody in, is in the union either. So it's more of where we have likes of, of Dingwall and Invergordon, where a lot of people who are in a dual contract, whole time retained, I have one gentleman in patrols who's whole time retained. So he's a He's a union member, so he will probably take the industrial action. But the others who are not in the union, it will be up to them individually whether they decide to respond or not. So I can't give a definite answer of what we'll do, but we are pulling out all the stops and planning because we are aware of this. I really hope it doesn't go to strike because I was there when we went to strike back in the early 2000s. It's, it's not a nice place. It's not good for anybody. So but it, it, it's just where we are. So we're working to, to react to that. I so, say, do you have a moment? Cause I just noticed Sarah has her hand up. So uh, are you wanting to come in with a question, Sarah? Yeah, um, I was going to ask, would, would pay impact, would pay be one solution to the recruitment in foot rows, or is it, is there, are there other factors? I've got two or three questions, actually. But yeah, no. Pay is certainly a factor. To, to explain how the retain work, and I, I don't want to take up too much of the meeting, but essentially at the moment we work two contract types for our on-call retained firefighters. So they either give us a 100% contract, which is they give up 120 hours a week cover, or we do a 75% contract, which is 90 hours a week. Now, th this is a, a system we've had in place for 30, 40 years, and it's, it's a massive ask from somebody, for somebody who's working, 
a 40 hour week. If you're giving me 120 hours, you've got eight hours to yourself. Now they're on call for that. They're not they're just carrying the pager for those 120 hours. So when they come in on their drill nights, they get paid for it. They get paid for it any home fire safety visits they do. And they get paid for any incidents respond, but essentially they're giving me 120 hours cover and that's what gives them a retaining fee. Now, when you break it down, they get paid not an awful lot for the amount of hours they cover. You know, people who are like a joiner, for example, if he left a job to respond to an incident, say a wildfire, and we had him up in a, on a hill fighting a wildfire, we're probably paying him £15 an hour. But as a joiner, if he's working his main job, he's getting £40 an hour. So the majority of people on the on-call routine that do it because they want to protect their communities. So pay certainly is an issue towards attracting people and holding them. But also to get into the to get into the service, you've got to go through a number of tests. You've got to make a fitness test, which the standards are. It's a standard the same for a whole time firefighter for retained firefighter. So the fitness test is uh, 42 VO2 max, which is 8.8 .8 in a treadmill. Or, sorry, a shuttle run, the beep test. That's quite a challenge. If you're 20, 20, 21, you're probably fit enough you can do that. But if we've got someone that's in their 50s want to join the service, we still have the same challenge because they've got to meet that standard. And some can and some can't. And this is a national thing ongoing. And then when you do join, we ask you to take 10 days to do your task and task management course, which is acquisition of the basic skills. Once you've done that, you can go back and you can respond to incidents on the crew, but you don't count as part of the crew because you haven't got your your BA, your BA training, your compressed air, the, the, the tanks in the back, because you need to have that. So that's another 10 day course, which we like to give people a minimum of six months up from one course to the next one, because they've got to consolidate their core skills. We can sometimes fast track it. I've had people doing it back to back because there's been a need. But until they get their BA, they can't turn out an appliance and count as part of the crew. So to turn an appliance out, I need to have a minimum of four people. I need one driver, one with a, a ticket, to, ticket to ride or an incident command ticket, and all four have to be BA qualified. So that's what challenges. So even though the, the gentleman from Fortrose is on his course this week, unless he can we can squeeze him forward and he's got capacity to give me another two weeks to go on another BA course, I'm probably not going to get him to count as part of the crew for six to eight months, which nice. is a challenge. And that's that's just the, the way we are at the moment. And we are desperately trying to modularize courses and so we can cut down the first task and task management course and maybe deliver it differently because to give up time to do two 10 day courses in your first year, that's all of someone's annual leave and more. And that's the challenge we face. And we're yeah. as, a, as a service nationally, we're trying to deal with that. But it's we have to maintain a standard. We can't you know, because we have to put people into expose them to dangerous conditions. So they have to meet a standard and they have to be trained because we have a duty of care. So it's 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 not an easy one to crack. So if you have any suggestions, I'd be delighted to hear them. I'll put my thinking cap on. <laughs> yeah. Um, just a couple of the quick ones. Um, I've noticed the false alarms are kind of quite high this year. Now, what what is the trigger for that? And also on the deliberate fires and the antisocial behaviour, how do we fare proportionately with other other wards, other bits of the Highlands? Uh, it, the two might be slightly connected or possibly? The UFAS tents are the unwanted fire alarm signals, which you talk about. We had five there, which was, uh, I'm just looking at my notes here, down, slight, down a wee bit in the previous quarter. So we had one in July, in August and two September, a couple from the Black Isle Leisure Centre. So that might be someone not deliberately setting it off, but you know, a deal drink can set off a smoke detector or steam from a shower right. and that type of thing. So we're trying to cut down on these. So we, we monitor it quite closely. So if a building repeatedly offends, so if we have 
maybe five or currencies in a in a eight week period or whatever, we would go along to premise and say, look, this is happening too often. What's the cause of it? Is that fault of the system? Is there processes we can put in place? And we'll work with them. We, we don't go on my heavy step. We go and try and work because we need the alarms and premises. If they keep repeating, we can we can ramp up our, uh, the pressure we put in them as such with the fire service. But we don't have the repeat offender, not repeat offenders. It, it's similar places. You know, we've had it in August with two, with one in the Black Air Leisure Centre and one in the town hall. So that could be a group and making a cup of tea and they are in a set, the set of detective off, whatever it may be. So if it's one here and one there, there's not a part into it, but if, if it becomes a premise keeps going and going, the, the classic used to be always rig more, but at tea time the nurses making toast would always set the smoke detector off. So we were always turning out and you think we're all racing up there for somebody's toast. So we've gone and done a lot of work and we've cut right back in that. So we will always work with premises. So if we get a number of UFAS at a premise, we'll go along and we'll see what the cause it is and see if we can reduce it because we don't want to be turning people out if we don't have to for numerous reasons. Can I ask very quickly, um, is there still um, youth firefighting qualifications happening locally? Yeah, we've got a couple of cadet courses we've run. Uh, there's one recently just run in Inverness. Uh, okay. And we're, 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 we've run one in Thurso now, and it's it's something we do look at. We also have uh, there's also. It, it was just in case there was a link between perhaps young people and some of the. Some of the, we we did have a, a wee spate over the summer there when there was uh, there was an individual in Kaboki who was acknowledged through the police, and we went and had a wee word with them. And you know, if people are flagged as a wee catch repeat offender, we will put measures in, you know, fire setters and we have a bit through our home fire safety advocates, we can go and we can speak to these people and, and just try and address it and make them aware of what they're doing. So if they're Thank part you. of the people come to light, we will go and deal with it. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Sarah, is yeah. there any more questions? Just uh -huh. about the um how we you know in terms of deliberate fires. And how are we? How do we fare? You know, proportionately. Is it is a week just kind of on some on the average, or we're we probably average across how we tend to get little spikes. With like I say, with, with a a youth in Kaboki that set a number of fire, fires over a small period, but he was tracked down basically because his pals had filmed him and that went on social media and. We, we got hold of them type of thing with it in conjunction with the police. So if we do have a spike, we do go and talk to schools, you know, and we will engage the schools. We recently did a, a cruise from Fortrose and Cromarty went to Fortrose High School because we have the VAR headsets for driving. So it, you put them on and for, for the kids that are just about leaving school, starting to drive, it takes them through a scenario of a good drive and then a drive that, that smashes and goes through it. And it it's quite hard hitting and it was very well received and that's something that we're quite keen to, to, to push about you know so uh, again we'll we'll try and engage with the groups locally and and promote safety issues and initiatives if we can and we run thematic action plans throughout the year so we've just done sort of bonfire fireworks probably move now into to christmas talking about candles and christmas trees and things like that and we, we, we try and push it on as best we can Oh, that's really interesting. Thank you. Yeah. I know that you're doing lots of um, community work, aren't you? Because, of course, if people are short of, short of money, they're going to be buying heaters that are probably not as safe. And it might be. And I, I know that there's yeah. a lot of work going on around that, isn't there? Which is fantastic. We're doing a lot of advertising because the biggest thing is, you know, if people start to bypass their meters and try and heat and all that. It's, yeah. It's, we're not in a great place, you know, in terms of society at the minute the way things are going so we're just we are aware of it and we're trying to do as much as we can and, and support as many people as we can and i think as well safety. there's there's definitely been an increase in people wanting things like an electric blanket rather than heating their home hasn't there which isn't always the safest of items to yeah, have in the first place yeah well if you, if you get a modern one it's fine and you know we we don't have a stock of electric blankets to hand out but as we go through our home fire safety visits and 
we're tied quite closely with social work. We have good connections there. So if someone's identified as vulnerable, we have got some we can go and give some blankets out or whatever it has. We have, you know, if people come to us that are in need, you know, it's not an indefinite supply, but we will help out where we where we can. And we are certainly uh, looking at supporting as many people as we can, but working together with social work and that things like that. Yeah. No, but thank you so much, Ricky. I really do appreciate um, your report and your taking the time to answer all our questions. So thank you very much for your time today. Yeah, no bother at all. And like I say, if you want to catch up, we look around the fire stations, a tour, stuff like that. You've got me, my address. You're, you're more than welcome. Give us a phone and we can, we can arrange something in it. The, the troops would be delighted to see you out there. You know, Fantastic. You what you're doing about. Okay, Thank you for your Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Bye. Okay, so if we can then move on to item four, which is the proposed plan for the Inner Murray Firth. And if I can hand over to Tim Stott, so he's got a presentation for us, I believe. Tim, thank you. Thanks, Chair. Um, hopefully you can see my uh, screen there. I just need to switch presenter view and hopefully you can see the, the, the first slide. Sorry, I is quite short. Uh, um, I say that this is a um, the item four is the Inner Murray Firth Local Development Plan two uh, uh, because the, there is there is one or, or already prepared for your ward area which dates back to 2015. Uh, this is the second plan that we've prepared that covers your ward. Um, I'm not going to go into detail for every village and town within your ward, but I, I I do have access to the maps and I can show those maps if you want to go into any of the uh, d detail. There's there's a, a lot of pages in Appendix One, which is the local detail that affects your ward, and Appendix Two to the the, the papers is um, a overarching issues that affect the plan area as a whole. Uh, it, that was the reason you got Appendix Two as well as Appendix One is to give you a bit of context uh, because you know when you're making uh, decisions on very local detailed issues then it's it's um, helpful to be aware of the wider plan context in making those decisions so uh, we are we're quite a long way on, uh, on in the plan process at the moment it began way back in 2019 when local uh, groups and local landowners and developers were asked to submit uh, what were called um, uh, well so it was called the call for sites uh, process at that time where every Everyone was allowed to put in site bids, if you like, or come up with ideas for what should be in the plan. Uh, we took all those ideas and ideas of our own, including that um, uh, several of the sites which were in the old uh, 2015 adopted plan. Those were included in a document called the Main Issues Report, which some of you may have seen that was published at the beginning of 2021. We did uh, a quite a lengthy consultation at that time. A, a lot of the community councils and other groups on the Black Isle took an active part in that, uh, which was um, you know, very, very good. Uh, lots of comments received at that point. Th th there were development site options at that stage. We were, as I say, we, we took all, all of the ideas, whether we thought they were good or bad, and uh, put them in the, the main issues report document at that time, invited public and other agency comment at that time. Um, and then a year ago at, um, a, I think it was, I don't, I can't remember, I think the Black Isle Committee had hived off as a separate from Dingwall and Seaforth at that time. So it was, I think it was the Black Isle Committee who, who made the decisions, if you like, on uh, which of the Black Isle's development sites you thought were good or bad. Uh, and that decision was made a year ago. Uh, so, so that was yeah, November 2021 when that decision was made. And those sites went into uh, the document, which was then called the proposed plan. That was issued for public objection this time around, so formal objection uh, to, 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 to the site choices the council had made a year ago. Uh, there was an opportunity for those who were upset, if you like, by the council's choice of sites, uh, were had a formal opportunity to, to, to comment uh, at the beginning of this year. So what, uh, sorry, the big uh, yellow box there is where we are now. Uh, so the, the the report in front of you today is the um, the report back on all these objections that have been lodged to the um, the council's choice of sites, and uh, also in Appendix One, Appendix Two is the answers, if you like, or the council's case uh, in in re re reply to the objections which have been lodged. And what happens after this meeting and the other local city committee meetings and uh, 
Economy and Infrastructure Committee at the beginning of next year is that we assemble all the uh, and the council's uh, case in reply to them are then passed to a government appointed uh, rep 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 reporter that happens uh, well it'll be sent to the government in March of next year and that government appointed reporter has the final say on the content of the council's plan so um, very briefly uh, lots of comments again uh, sorry lots of formal objections really uh, this time around uh, between March and June of this year most people are as you might imagine, are concerned about uh, lo local issues. So as say, Appendix 1 is what you're being asked to endorse. That's the local detail for your ward. Um, so just to make clear, uh, I know Tor and North Cassock are on the boundary between the Dingwall and Seaforth ward and your own ward. So we've included uh, uh, the detail for North Cassock and Tor within both of the committee meetings. So you know both sets of um, members have an interest in it. Um, and, and yeah, the final point there, perhaps on that slide, is the most important one that there isn't really a lot of opportunity to to, to make major changes because, as I say, the the area committees made the the decision on the local content a year ago. There is, however, an opportunity to fine tune the council's uh, position uh, if, in light of the comments received, or if there's been major. Uh, changes in circumstances since uh, the local committee made a decision a year ago, uh, then there is an opportunity to fine tune things. And within your ward uh, and, and within Appendix 1, the detail, we're, we're make, we're, uh, we put forward for your consideration uh, minor tweaks, if you like, to the content of the plan. Um, a, a, Person in Och is concerned about the um, allocation for the refurbishment or the further refurbishment of the harbour at Och. Uh, the Harbour Trust have done some works in there, uh, and but our our allocation, the, our line on the map uh, for Och goes uh, and encloses the a small green area on the front of Och, if you know it, but next to the harbour, it's where there's an in, an in, an interpretation panel and there's um, a picnic benches and basically the the um, the person who's commented has, has asked us to draw that boundary back so the green space isn't affected by it and you know as I say that that seems to make make sense um, uh, so, so yeah we're that's one of the fine tuning adjustments that we're putting to you today uh, to say so to just draw that boundary and so the uh, picnic table and the in interpretation panel are not affected by it um, and, and yes it more importantly also a, a bigger bigger um, tweaks if you like uh, Cromarty uh, the community council and the, com uh, the community trust have made comments which I think are, are you know well well founded comments uh, they've asked for the um, the text of the plan to be tweaked to reference um, if um, we basically expect a, a positive opportunity Cromarty Firth announcement probably on Thursday of this week. Um, a um, Freeport Greenport um, status might be awarded to uh, Highland Ports at that point. Um, and, uh, you know, if that happens and if there are a lot more jobs at NIG, then um, you know it, the the community council and the community trust how rightly I think see that as an opportunity to try and get a bit of developer funding for improvements to the NIG ferry. So uh, as I say, I, th I think you know as I say, if if uh, if there is a positive OCF announcement, uh, then obviously we will make the government appointed reporter aware of that and uh if we if we want to get ask developers for any cash then having a hook within the council's plan is a, a very important uh basis for uh, asking for cash associated with any planning application or other planning proposal so uh if you don't include it within the council's plan and you don't you know up up front about uh the link between development and the ferry funding uh then as i say it, it makes it more difficult at planning application stage to uh, ask a, a, a developer for developer contribution funding at that point. So all that means that it's a good idea to put the hook within the council's plan to uh, reference the link between improving the ferry link and uh, hopefully major growth at NIG and jobs off the back of that. Um, Bayview Crescent, you 
may well be aware this is on the west side of Cromer too. There's a uh, again a, the community trust I think are leading on it to get um, a, a camper van um, caravan service point there. Um, basically, so so that they uh, they have quite a large area of land, or I, I think maybe in the process of trying to acquire a slightly bigger site there. And they, they, they want us to broaden the acceptable uses on that wider area of land. And because there's a lack of affordable housing sites or effective affordable housing sites within Cromarty, they're asking us to uh, say uh, for the plan to broaden the uses of, uh, uh, that would be acceptable Bayview Crescent and asking us to add in uh, housing or affordable housing as an acceptable use for that site. Um, as officers, we think that's a good, good idea as well. Um, the most controversial site if you like in Cromarty has been the, the one uh, to the south of the Mance just as you come into Cromarty on uh, the 832 just on your left hand side as you uh, big up just before you drop drop down into the town on the left hand side there we've allocated this land uh, Mr McBean's the landowner he's uh, prepared to make it available for a, a, a housing affordable housing and housing for local people only uh, the community council are reasonably happy with that concept uh there's a neighbor who's objecting to it uh um but yeah so, so the one of the this is about the detail of there's a list for each site there's a list of developer requirements i.e what the developer has to do to uh, have a reasonable chance of obtaining planning consent and one of those is to improve the what's called the active travel you know walk or cycle links into the rest of the town and we, at the moment, the text uh, includes a, a preference for uh, a new active travel link to down the pay into the town. And the uh, I think both the, the Community Council and the Community Trust are uh, concerned that that shouldn't be the preferred active travel route back into the town. Uh, and, uh, you know, as I say, I, rather than uh, highlight the pay as the, the best route in, uh, sorry, the, the, the basic point is that it doesn't lead directly to the school or a lot of the other community facilities within the town and therefore uh, the plan shouldn't highlight it as the the only route or the best route so we're uh, going to say within the detail of appendix one we suggest to yourselves and to the report if you agree uh, that we drop the preference for uh, an active travel link via the pay and that uh, chair members is is it oh sorry uh, very briefly they just to make you aware that the wider context here this is one of six um, reports to the uh, relevant local and city committees this month uh, the the matters in uh, appendix two which are uh, about the general policies in the front end of the plan they're going to be reported to the economy and infrastructure committee who have the the power if you like to decide on those those matters so that's the uh, beginning of next year hopefully when we uh, if and when we get through all these uh, the seven relevant committees uh, we then uh, submit the plan all the objections uh, and appendix one and two for every committee and that all gets sent to Scottish ministers in March of next year thereafter the this examination process begins uh, it lasts at least a year so as I say we're not going to get the final outcome of the plan process which is the receipt of the reporter's report until early 2024 and then that finally is the end of the plan process thank you chair thank you tim that was uh, very comprehensive going over those bits and bobs and and obviously the the amount of detail that we've had in our papers has been substantial um so so thank you for all that information um just obviously i mean part of the the comment that i wanted to give you was that obviously for the three of us as a committee we were not actually party to the decisions that were made obviously before we were elected so so for for us as um the three black Isle councillors this is perhaps our our first opportunity to to formally comment on the development plan um one of the things that um that did strike me is um the the idea of building homes without the matching infrastructure to so building homes as opposed to building communities i think is is an important takeaway for me that should there be a limit on housing building unless there's the infrastructure within that community so that people are not isolated and i think especially given the 
the commentary that's been going lately about the sort of, you know, localised act of travel, 20 minute community, all that jazz. Um, and the other things that I was wanting to comment on were that um, obviously that's great what you're saying about Opportunity Cromity Firth and, and obviously the whole of the Black Isle forms part of that area. Um, and I, I think I would completely agree with the community that I am in Cromarty that having links on the ferry for, you know, the possible commuter traffic through the Black Isle, people living in the Black Isle all year round as opposed to seasonal is a fantastic plan. Um, but I'm just wondering about perhaps the developer type contributions into certain areas of our community that really need it. Um, for instance, the more places like Tor had the plan for quite a lot of housing at Tor, but obviously Tor as itself is missing quite a lot of infrastructure in terms of its hall being out of action and, um, you know, again, having, a, you know, a very, very small school, uh, you know, the hall out of action, where does Tor sit with getting its community feel in all of this? So, sorry, and I'll, but before you want to answer that, I'll pass over to Sarah. Thanks. Thank you, Tim, for the presentation and the, I mean, the immense amount of work that goes on in this process. And obviously, you know, a year ago in December, we weren't the councillors that were making these decisions. I mean, this might not be the right place. I've got a couple, I've got a couple of strategic um, issue points to raise, but also that one feeds very directly into Och village. Um, strategically, I mean, there's there's so much, and this has been this is when I was community councillor as well. And it's not it's not to kind of get at anybody, but the developer contributions issue is it is it is a big one, and it I think it's the feeling of a feeling of a lack of a lack of transparency and people not not nobody being in the room, you know, not. And I I I do think that. I mean, community councils are the are the the first rung of the democratic ladder. I do think, even if it's across a ward, there has to be some better system that people feel confident and trusting in. And at the moment, I I've been reading all the papers and the comments more broadly on the strategic appendix too. There is there is a real lack of there's a lack of trust. I mean, there was a mention that about twelve million, whether this is true or not, twelve million to High Life Highland. I mean, you could see the logic of that on one level, but on another level, I mean, I just, I just think somehow or other, whether this is the right to raise the committee, whether it's a bigger issue, it's got to be, has to be addressed. And I think it is about trust, transparency, and decisions made with the community being party to them, even if in the end they don't disagree with the decisions that are being made, because obviously not everyone's going to get everything that they want in life. The second point is. And this gets me as well when I'm on because I'm on planning indicative housing numbers. I mean, I, I haven't I haven't seen one application where the indicative number matches the actual number that comes in on a plan. Again, erosion of trust in communities. Um, and this directs me to OCK and AVO2. Is it Mural House at the mm. indicative housing 80? I think 130 houses. I mean, that's a that's a massive hike, and I think the concerns of the community are genuine. I mean, I don't th I don't think this is the obviously the place to talk about house numbers, is it? Basically, because it's a specific application, and also I'm on the planning committee, so I probably should comment. But I think the report does rather dismiss the concerns of Op Primary. That was that was my initial gut feeling when I was reading it. I think it feels very dismissive. And we know that Oc Primary has, I mean, it's always been, it's always had a lot of kids in it. For all the years I've lived here, 20 plus years, my own daughter going through, even before her, they said, oh no, more kids used to come from Oc. It's always been busy. But I know this year, I mean, I've totted up one, two, three, four, five of the other primary schools in the Black Isle, and all five will only make up the same number that have gone into primary one in Oc. So it is it is an issue and they do feel that it's not taken seriously enough 
and it's not the the projections are not what the reality ends up being you know in the terms of the birth rate people moving in and babies etc so whether all of the kind of modeling etc needs to be looked at in terms of planning the school numbers and the school role and as Lindsay was pointing out you know these these schools create community um and these schools don't have I mean the ox got all of that field but it's just waterlogged the whole time there's nowhere for these kids to play much outside of you know in winter you just you go you go out to the playground you come in covered in mud so I I think all of this is quite important so I'm happy to chat outside the meeting or have a chat with the infrastructure committee as well about it because I, I feel the community do feel rather dismissed that's just from what I've heard and what I'm from reading so it's but it's not a to get it and it was the immense amount of work that everyone's put into this report thus far so those are my main ones oh no just a quick question about Manlocky 0.8 hectares it's about a hectares two and a half acres is that a good the the site that was potentially you know kept back for potential primary or educational site is that big in, is that what kind of size school does that build and that kind of is it enough to have a school in a playing field that you know, I'm speaking as a person, member of the public, who wouldn't, you know, I'm not a planner. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, right. A, the first point uh, that you raised, Chair, was the um, is there enough capacity in sc uh, school capacity, water and sewage capacity, road, road capacity for the amount of development we uh, are planned for in the plan? Um, I'd have to say, a, yeah, that there are. Um, across the whole of the plan area in every town and village there's a lack of spare capacity in uh, at least one of one of those uh, net networks if you like so that there's no perfect place where you have spare capacity in in schools roads water and sewage um, so that there isn't there isn't easy options what, what, what i would say comp certainly compared to the 2015 plan there's far fewer sites earmarked for development on the black hour than there were in that old older plan so we have because of the lack of capacity in various networks across the Black Hour, we've cut back on the amount of sites that are earmarked for de de development. Um, you mentioned Tor in particular. Yes, I mean, the, the, you'll have seen that um, Springfield Homes have bought land at Tor, a huge tract of land uh, between the A9 South and the Muir Board Roads. Uh, so so that it isn't just an option that they've got with the farmer, they've actually bought all, the, all of the land. So they, they are and they're, they're, they're trying to pursue parallel pre-application and planning application uh, at, at the moment on that site. You'll see within Appendix 1, we keep saying no to it. We're not um, we're not going to endorse any new development allocation at all. And the reason for that is, it, yeah, you, you know, you're right that the, the school doesn't have an awful lot of capacity and, and the hall needs to be rewired, I think. And there's all sorts of issues um, with it. But yeah, the, the, the biggest uh, constraint to development is the uh, the surge capacity. There's a collection of septic tanks serve uh, tour. They, they have very little, if any, capacity left in them. Um, uh, public, full public sewage with a new sewage works needs, needs to be brought in. Um, Springfield Homes have looked at the cost of doing that. Uh, I, I don't think even they can afford to do it. And uh, so, so the other option would be to lay along sewer all, all the way to Och, where there is some spare capacity. There's about a thousand units spare, spare capacity in the sewage works at Och. Uh, or you go across the Black Isle to uh, Muir Revord, where the, there's a combined works, uh, serves Muir Revord and Bewley. Um, so, yeah, so, so, so yeah, a lack of um, a sewage capacity is one of the big reasons why we're saying no to uh, the tour proposal. We hope the government appointed reporter will also uh, turn um, that proposal down as well. Uh, on 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 the uh, 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 I say mainly on the basis of, of a lack of sewage capacity there. Um, so sorry, uh, going to on to Och, um, as I'm sorry, this wider issue of uh, how we uh, seek developer contributions and how we use them. Um, yeah, this is a lot of the area committees have raised this. I'd have to say we, we, we've been to uh, this is the, kind of the the third or the fourth of the uh, local and city committees that we've been to. Uh, and if you if you've read Appendix Two, then you'll see that the yeah, nine of the community councils across the plan area have joined forces and raised this issue with us. Um, 
a present. Uh, it's an internal senior officers and, and only officers within the council sit on a uh, a a developer contributions working group and they decide on the allocation of cash that comes in. Um, there is there is clear um, a high and wide guidance. Uh, it's called a, um, a developer contributions guide, which is uh, I was consulted upon. It's published. Um, you know, you can if you want to see how much money we take for schools or community uh, buildings, then it's all that's all been uh, clearly set out since uh, 2019. Uh, so, so that you know, I can send members that detailed guidance note. So that sets the amount that we ask for and what we ask for cash for. Um, but how it's used, I think, is more the issue, and it and how it's ring fenced. You know, with it within what boundary is it ring fenced? Uh, that that is up for debate. Uh, sorry, it, it that the, well, the the current way of doing it is community facility developer contributions. It's around about a thousand pound a house that we take. And it's ring fenced of the high school catchment. So it's quite a wide area uh, that it's ring fenced to. And most of the community councils that have commented on this issue want it to be ring fenced at a more local level, so to a, a particular town or village. And um, the reason currently it's ring fenced to the much wider high school catchment boundary is because. Uh, there won't always be a community facility within every uh, small village where the, it needs imp improvement, if you like. So um, if we were to ring fence it to a very small area, then there wouldn't always be a community facility uh, that can receive that cash uh, or um, uh, sorry, and, and or uh, the, there might not be a community body w with the balance funding because often it's a small amount of cash, you know, if it's only a thousand pound a house and it's only eight houses, say, uh, then there's not going to be sufficient money coming in from the developer to actually fund the improvement. There has to be the balance funding from the local group or from other public uh, funding um, uh, um, places to, to actually fund the rest of the money required for the village hall to be Im improved or you know, whatever it is. So that that's why uh, at present the, the ring fencing of the, the collective monies is, a, um, is at the high school catchment area level. Uh, I think uh, Councillor Atkin mentioned the High Life Highland, you know, why, a high life, why is the money being reserved for High Life Highland? Uh, well, I'd have to say one reason is that, is that the, um, the the High Line High Life Highlands sit on this officer working group, uh, but the other the reason is is they have a, a bigger capital program than a lot of the other community groups, and they can commit this balance funding for an awful lot of the projects as well. So uh, that that's why a lot of the money presently goes to High Life Highland. I'm uh, sorry, High Life High Highland buildings are open. To to all, you know, as well. So, you know, the, the, it, um, whereas, you know, the, if it's a particular community group in a particular village, it, it, not everybody in that community might you know, you, you, you use it or, you know, it might go to a private uh, bowls, bowls club, say. So, you know, it, it's, it's, it, it, I say that that's, that's the reason that the current practice is, is that, that there is a, a preference for High Life Highland buildings because as I say they they tend to, to, to be open to all they tend to be in the bigger places so more people in theory can access them and as I say they, they often have uh, uh, they, the High Life Highland capital program has uh, a more of a guarantee if you like of the balance funding being available to, to actually provide that uh, building the other issue which uh, a lot of members are not aware of is that we can't take money from a developer unless it's um, offsetting the direct impact of that particular development. So, for example, say Tor, I think they want to rewire their village hall. Uh, so taking money from a developer to rewire an existing building isn't adding capacity to that building. So we can only take money from a developer if it's if it, as I say, there's a direct connection between the extra houses and the extra people in the, those extra houses, or the extra kids in those houses, and the uh, and the the um, the bigger building that we need. So if it was a bigger village hall that we needed for the extra people in the extra houses, that's fine. We can reasonably take money from a developer for that. But if it's to just refurbish an existing hall and it's it, we can't reasonably take money from a developer for that. So as I say, with um, high schools and primary schools where it's far easier to prove there's a capacity issue, you know, 
extra houses with extra children in them, uh, it, it, it's easier to prove there's a direct uh, uh, causal link, if you, you like, between the extra houses, the extra children, and needing the extra physical capacity at the school buildings. So that's easy, and that's why it's, uh, you, you know, we do take uh, uh, money, you know, it can be up to around about £10,000 a house for uh, additional school building capacity. But it has to be a capacity issue. It can't be just a, as I say, simply refurbish a building which is already there. So, so that's what that's the context, if you like. Uh, however, we do recognise that the allocations of money coming in, it's as I say, it, it's maybe not the best. That it's um, an opaque uh, tra uh, officer-only group that makes the decisions. So, what, uh, as far as I understand, what we're going to do now is there's going to be a report to the Economy and Infrastructure Committee with the terms of reference of this officer working group. Uh, and asking the members of the Economy and Infrastructure Committee whether they agree with those terms of reference. So, you know, a more formalised basis for this officer group that decides on the allocation of cash. And I guess uh, the terms of reference could also look at the uh, uh, within what what boundary do you ring fence the cash as well. So, you know, so that, that hopefully that will give an opportunity for the members on the ENI committee to to um, comment on whether they agree with the terms of reference. Uh, and as I say, what, and, and I, you know, again, I, I was asked this at the Dingle and Seaforth committee meeting, and I think uh, local members should have a role. To be blunt, because it, you know, if, if if officers are trying to choose between whether the local village hall should get the cash or another community group in the same village should get the cash, then uh, to me, officers shouldn't be making that that sort of choice. You know, uh, uh, members are, are, are better placed uh, to choose between two competing uh, local groups. Uh, you know, you, you you'll have a better feel for whether. You know that there that the, there is more need for a you know the, the village hall to be bigger or for another local group to have a new b b building size. So, so yeah. So um, you know for all those reasons, we accept that the the current arrangements are not ideal, uh, and as said, there'll be a formal opportunity for members uh, uh, certainly on the ENI committee to have their their uh, say on that. Um, indicative housing capacities was mentioned. Yes, we would accept. Certainly in the past, certainly the 2015 plan, we tended to set them low. Uh, and uh, that's why developers at planning application stage often came in with higher higher uh, numbers. Um, the What we tried to this time around is actually set the numbers a bit higher. Uh, because government guidance to every council is to set to higher higher numbers. Uh, the argument for doing so is that it's a more efficient use of land. If you're putting more houses on the same piece of land, uh, it's seen as a more efficient use of land. We have a lot of complaints about uh, us allocating prime farmland and uh, getting a productive use for prime farmland is seen as um, you know a, a more important thing as well these days. So if we are going to allocate sites and maybe we should allocate fewer sites, uh, we need to make best use of them, and that's the argument for the uh, the housing numbers being higher. Um, Murail House itself in Arch, yes, the, this is Broadland properties own it, you'll see that they are asking for more housing. So, so sorry, please be aware in Appendix 1, you see the uh, the local communities are saying the numbers are far too high and the landowners and the developers are saying they're far too, too low. <laughs> so, um, you know, be aware that all these objections, whether they're pro or anti-development, go to the government appointed rep reporter and it's up to that reporter to decide whether, um, uh, you know, whether basically but the, the council is often caught in the uh, medal between the uh, the very pro development parties and the very anti development uh, groups. So we we've, we've tried to be more balanced in the uh, the number of sites and the capacity of those sites. In terms of our primary school capacity, yes, because of the um, uh, early years um, and basically the nursery investment, the additional uh, I think there's an additional classroom for the nursery, which is freed up capacity within the main within the main school. So um, the um, Och primary school physical capacity figure has gone up. There are detailed school role forecasts for every primary school and high school, and uh, the Och uh, primary school is being rejigged at the moment. Um, we work with, you know, that team on rerunning the school role forecast. Those will be published uh, before the end of 
this year, and there'll be a brand new physical capacity uh, figure for Och Primary at that time. We're rerunning the housing forecast. So obviously, when we're predicting the school role forecast, we need to try and second guess how much housing development there'll be within the catchment and how many primary school and high school kids will result from the additional housing as well. So it's basically there's a, a rule of thumb of around about um, you need five new houses to generate one additional primary school child. Uh, so that's that that's the, uh, the the basic assumption that's fed in to the forecast. But yeah, those the, those, uh, the rerun of our primary school will be uh, uh, and, and all the other primary and high and the high school on the black will be rerun and there'll be new figures very very soon um and finally yes a malachi yeah 0 0.8 hectares you're right uh, is in insufficient for a new primary school on that land um uh, broadlands though have agreed if you look at the, their comments they've uh, they 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 are uh, sorry the plan and the plan text and uh broadlands comment it means that they are happy that uh, it could be used that a, a bigger area of land could be used for a primary school if needed i'd have to say and you'll see a broadlands property so, uh, the reason that they've, they've been uh, kind on that issue is that they've got major development uh, they're trying to uh, persuade the council to put in a, a, a huge new housing site to the southwest of monarchy which we said uh, no to as officers at least um so so yeah so um 0.8 hectares is in is insufficient but the plan allows for that site to be bigger if there's a need uh we if we don't have all these brand new housing sites we don't think we for the particular school there there is a need there is uh, at Och, and sorry going back to to Och, uh the big site uh, muir ale house uh, that we're endorsing isn't for housing only there's a primary school safeguard um, portion of that site as well so we 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 uh if uh um and as you say, the Och site is cramped. You can't really keep on adding buildings to it. Um, so the, the, that's why the um, Muir Ale House includes a safeguard of land for a new primary school or maybe uh, extra primary school buildings being placed on the Muir Ale House site. So that if if Och, and it's most likely that Och would need to expand, the uh, Muir Ale House site is the optimum place on which those buildings could be put. Having said that, uh, Nest Gap. If you look at the Fortro's comments, uh, the Nest Gap site, the there's a small, um, uh, well, sorry, there's land earmarked there. Uh, not, sorry, not there's not um, a specific allocation of land, but but that that land is um, the 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 one remaining Big Gap site at Nest Gap is um, safeguarded as a potential primary school site as well, uh, albeit it's in multiple ownerships there's about three different owners there and uh not all of them are willing to release it for that uh, that uh, use so to say that that's that's uh, one of the other options but um uh, in terms of the detailed plan tax the uh, Mur murail house broadland zone site i think is the optimum given as a single land ownership and the uh well the, the broadlands if you read the detail of the response they're saying they're not keen on it but uh as i say if if uh, if they're trying to get a plan of consent for housing, then I think that they, uh, that's why we, we would try to persuade them through the plan and the application process to make a new primary school site available as part of a, of a mixed use development there. Uh, and I think that's the answers to all your points. Thank you. Thank you. The other the one, Lindsay, sorry. Oh, no, I was, I was just going to say thank you for all of that and those very comprehensive answers as well. This, um, yeah, we, yes. we had a bit of a talk about um, the Keswick you know, that the Keswick site, Belfield, mm. that, um, I mean, it's in such, it's honestly such a long way. I mean, it really is a bit of a hike for active travel to, I mean, I'm just thinking how people really behave rather than how we like, you know, we just wish we, I mean, if you, you know, if it's pouring with rain on a November morning, I mean, you're actually almost to the point of a couple of miles needing to school transport, really, from there to the primary school, wouldn't, wouldn't you say? I mean, is, uh, is it about two? Is it about two? We were thinking of maybe is it up to two miles away from? No, no. So sorry. Well, no, no. The the uh, Belfield farm. So again, it's uh, Broadlands of the landowner. And then the the, right. the the Belfield site is just to the west of the old Belfield farm where the Tullock houses have gone. Yes. Uh, and the but the North Keswick Primary School is is reasonably close to it. Uh, yeah, it's probably 
under a mile, I would say, um, um, walking from the, the this the, sorry, the, just, just to make clear, the the um, the council uh, isn't endorsing all of what Broadlands want at uh, Belfield Farm. Um, Broadland, we've we've I think we've zoned it for 80 houses, but they're they're wanting 100 and odd. Uh, so uh, maybe the 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 additional portions of land that Bel Broadlands would like are further than the uh, a, a longer non-active travel dif distance to the local school. But yeah, the, certainly the, the portion of land uh, that we're suggesting is reasonable is, is well, sorry, the, the, the eastern end of it maybe is, is within a reasonable active travel distance. And it, unlike a lot of places in Highland, it's reasonably flat, you know, the actual route. So certainly uh, kids could cycle uh, uh, um, to it. So um, but, yeah, so, yeah, so 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 yeah, I, maybe the, the yeah the the western margin of it, yeah, the far western margin, and, and that's the other reason that we we kept the uh, the western margin of that Belf that uh, Belfield Farm site, drew it back a bit. Uh, again, Broadlands wanted it to go further west towards the the next farm, uh, but yeah, we we've, we've tried to uh, keep the the western boundary of it in. Um, you know, as well. So, so yeah, it, maybe yeah, maybe the, the the children in the western end of the allocation would have to cycle as opposed to walk. Great. Um, are there any further questions, or can we go to um, approving the recommendations? That's been very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, members. With with the caveat that I mean, presumably we can have you know discussions and. The infrastructure committee on the strategic stuff is that yeah yes so yeah, yeah. The, the, it's not, this uh, isn't it is it you know well, I mean, well, it's sorry. kind of it on one level because so it, it's it is it for the local detail in appendix yeah. one but it's not it for the the wider issues which are in appendix two yeah the, say the uh in our committee on um February the second has the power to decide on all those issues in appendix two so, so yes yeah, so, so if you have a you know if you know you know including the the you know an awful lot of the issues you know you know which you've raised uh, sorry just the one final point so the um the dingle and seaforth committee again raised this uh there's a there's a one of the new general policies uh if councillors on the the north planning applications committee committee or the south planning applications committee feel there isn't sufficient uh capacity in the various networks to support a particular application what the, this new general policy has a clause in it that uh, gives you a hook to reject a planning application if you think there's not sufficient school school capacity or water sewage capacity road capacity uh, then for the first time to be honest in highland policy there's a there's a clause in that uh, that general the new general policy that allows members to reject a planning application there hasn't uh, Aberdeenshire Council um, have, have uh, had a similar policy and used it recently. A developer appealed against the refusal. Uh, the reporter ag um, agreed with the um, the council's rejection, and it went all the way to the quarter session. And uh, eventually, at the quarter, quarter session, the uh, the inner house of the quarter session agreed that um, refusing a planning application on a lack of, and it was school capacity in that case. Uh, that it was reasonable for a, a council to refuse a, a, a planning application on the lack of um, uh, sufficient school c capacity. What we do at present is we just take the developer's cash. So we take the up to £10,000 a house and we think by just taking uh, the the £10,000 a house that it offsets the impact of the development. Without taking account of in the wider council's capital programme, do we have all the rest of the money to provide that school or the extra buildings. So often we're taking the the money from the for, from the developer, which offsets the extra kids that they will have from their development, but without a hope in hell of having the the rest of the money in the council's capital program to fund the additional school or the additional school building. So I say that that Aberdeenshire uh, took that approach that. Although the, the, the developer offered money to offset the particular impact of that particular development, uh, the council's wider capital program didn't have the rest of the money to actually resolve the issue. And, and as I say, that that as I say that went to refusal, a reporter's decision, and then eventually to the quarter session and the, the, 
court of session agreed it was reasonable for a planning authority uh, to refuse an application if not only that you know the, the the developer offered the money but if the wider capital program didn't have enough money in it to resolve the issue and actually provide the additional school capacity then that was a reasonable reason for refusal that's that's just phenomenally that's a huge massive change then does that, is that just school places or what would be could it be nhs could it be you know. <laughs> oh, oh, right. yeah, well, where does it end? Yeah. You know? NHS is a really tricky year. And again, uh, one of the other committees uh, raised this currently. And again, if, if when the terms of reference for the officer working group goes to e and committee, you can raise this if you wish. But the uh, currently we don't take money from uh, for health facility impacts. And the reason we don't do that is because NHS Highland don't provide us with the evidence. If we're taking any developer money, we have to prove that their development causes a capacity issue. Uh, and it's more tricky with health facility capacity to prove that there's an impact because with schools, they have a defined catchment and we know how many kids there are within the catchment and in the school. And we, it's far, there's more evidence to basically to prove that additional development has an impact. Whereas with a, a GP practices, they don't have defined catchments. They don't have a fixed catchment boundary and you don't have to register with your nearest GP practice. And with dentists, it's the same thing, thing as well. So without a defined catchment um, and uh, NHS Highland have not been prepared to share patient numbers at GP practices with us as well. Uh, so it's fraught. It's um, trying to compile the uh, enough evidence to to prove that a development and the extra people in the development causes a health facility capacity issue is far more difficult than it is with schools or uh, water and sewerage or roads even. Uh, weirdly, uh, National Planning Framework 4, which was laid before par Parliament uh, by the Planning Minister last Thursday, has give, gives local councils the right to have uh, seek uh, health facility developer contributions. Uh, so uh, the national planning framework, which we have to fit in with now, uh, that allows us to seek health facility developer contributions. But uh, um, unfortunately, unless your local NHS trust is going to work with you to share the evidence required to justify them, uh, then a developer could easily cry foul when asked for to cough up the cash. So, so yeah, it, it's... Um, Hopefully, the fact that it's in the National Planning Framework 4 now, uh, we, we can use this to go back to NHS Highland and ask them to be uh, to, to share the evidence with us um, that we need to, uh, to to ask developers for cash. Because, you know, without the evidence, the developer, when we ask them, is going to turn around and say, nope, no, thank you. Um, so, yeah, we, we need um, sufficient evidence to, to back up the ask for money. Thanks for that, Tim. That's usually Great. a thing. If um, are we ready to go through the the recommendations and and have an opinion on them? So um, the recommendation number in two two point one i um, that the agree the recommended council response to the place specific issues relevant to this committee area raised and representations received at the proposed plan are set out in appendix one are we agreed 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 okay we're asked to note the issues raised in representations as they relate to strategic matters that may have implications for this committee area and note that working draft response to these issues is set out in appendix two is that noted yes, yes. thank you we are to authorise officers to undertake the statutory and other procedures required to submit the plan to Scottish ministers and to progress the plan through to its examination up to but excluding the plan's adoption and authorise the Executive Chief Officer, Infrastructure, Environment and Economy in consultation with the Chair of this committee to make any necessary habitats, regulations, appraisal, factual or other non-material changes to Appendix 1 prior to sub submission to the Scottish Government. Is that authorised? Yes. Sorry, I've got a phone ringing in the background. Yeah. I'm going to switch it off. Sorry, apologies for that. <laughs> um, okay, and um, 
yeah, so thank you very much for your time today, Tim. I think we have agreed and noted everything there that we were needing to for the report. Um, yeah. so thank you, Bambi. Yes, thank you very much for your time. Okay, bye now. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thanks very much. Oh, and now we are moving on to item number five, which is the ward discretionary budget. So this will be for the, the items that have come in since the last committee. Da, da, da. Just yes. So Dot, are you wanting to take us through the, the couple of items on there? I think it's the so items, wasn't there? Sorry, Chair. Um, in terms of the, uh, I was on, I was on the uh, common good paper, so I'm just looking back to your agenda. Apologies. Um, yes. Yeah, so item five, the year award discretionary budget. These are just for noting. Uh, members have previously supported these through their their area business meetings. And if you're happy, I can go on to item six, which is the Cromarty Common Good Fund. That would be great. Yes. Thank you, Dot. And uh, this item, members, I uh, won't talk you through the report. It's standard reporting that comes to your area committee every quarter. I'm happy to take any questions on it. I may need to take any questions away for the for the ward manager, as it's herself that um, manages the fund, but happy to take any questions on the Cromarty Common Good financial report. I, I was personally happy with it, and it was quite self-explanatory. Um, do either of you have any other questions or the, comments on it? The same, same here, Dot. Yeah, same for me. Great. Thank you, Chair. OK, will we move on to the Fortress one? And the Fortress one, similarly, uh, happy to try to answer or take away any, any questions on this one as well. Um, just, again, sorry, go, yes, Sarah. I, no, the one question I put for, um, when are they? Are there any rents being renegotiated? But okay. some of when, when when are they? You know how how often? When's the next? I think it's not not too long, isn't it? A couple of a year next year or something. I was going to say I, I will need to check that, so yeah. I'll take that question away and we'll get the answer back to you. Thank you. And the but yes, I was happy with the contents of the report as was. Yeah. And if, I mean, if they're reasonably standard, I mean, I did even wonder whether, I mean, it's quarterly, but I, I mean, almost, unless there's a huge amount of activity, whether it's biannually is, you know, perhaps because there's a lot of work goes into preparing reports, but okay. there isn't yep, a huge no, amount of movement since the okay. last, since the last one, just, just to yep. note that and yes. see what Di says when she's feeling better. That's fine. We'll just check in case there's any legal restriction that you have to see it every three months as trustees, but uh, we'll, we'll certainly take that suggestion away that it would then come back to every other committee. Thank you. And and are you happy as well, Marvin May? Yes, I am. Thanks. Fantastic. So that, that, that should wrap up the, the Common Good Funds then. Um, so if everybody's happy, we'll move on to item seven with Ian McCreef and the the speed limit changes in Kilbokey. Thank you. Uh, good morning, councillors. Um, morning. Thank you for coming along this morning, Ian. Morning. Not at all. Um, this report uh, um, basically concerns the objection received to the proposed 20 and 40 mile an hour speed limits in Kilbokey. And um, the report, first of all, details the relationship between proposed speed limits and the Kilbokey Active Travel Scheme process for setting out a, a traffic regulation order to enact a speed limit. The outcome of the consultation stage, uh, the details of the one objection received, and finally, it asks the committee to determine whether the objection is upheld in which case the speed limit order will not proceed, or if the objection is rejected and the speed limit can then go ahead. So um, just to give a bit of a background, the proposed speed limits are required to allow the Kilbokey Active Travel Scheme to be built to the appropriate standards. The Active Travel Scheme's objectives are to encourage walking and cycling, especially within the village. 
This is achieved by traffic calming measures, improved footways, reduced traffic speeds. Alternative designs not requiring a speed limit were not viable as there was insufficient land available to construct uh, separate or remote cycleways. And um, the proposed speed limits were designed to complement the active travel scheme proposals. However, this report only really concerns the objection to the proposed speed limit. So looking at the process, um, uh, in summary, um, the steps required to, to promote a, a speed traffic regulation order are to prepare a drawing, discuss with the councillors at a ward business meeting, preparing the draft uh, legal orders. Legal services then check and approve the order. We then have a 14 day consultation process, 21 day objection period. And because we've received an objection, it then comes to the committee to determine the outcome. For the consultation process, um, it started on the 21st July 22. Uh, it lasted 14 days. It included uh, the emergency services, the councillors, community councils, etc. And in particular, Fern Torch Community Council. Uh, I would like to say Fern Torch Community Council did an excellent job. They they widely consulted with the residents in Kilbogie. Um, we received, uh, I believe, 43 responses, which the community council had uh, anonymised, and then forwarded to ourselves. We also received a copy of a of a response from a Mr. Barton and Miss Lloyd. Um, in total, there were 102 separate issues raised, um, of which 63 related directly to the proposed speed limit. Um, all these were detailed in the uh, in my report in depth. However, in summary, uh, that there were 31 uh, uh, comments uh, in favour, either fully or partially supportive of the speed limits. Five against. Um, Eleven talked about the extent of the of the speed limits. Eight related to accidents. Five related to uh, the impacts of the proposed speed limits. Um, two comments were, were received regarding the, the actual legal process and one on speeding. But there were uh, additional comments um, that we received uh, that, that weren't really related to the speed limit order itself. Uh, and although I've detailed those in my report, uh, I, I won't go into that in, in in any detail here. Moving on to the objection period. It was a 21 day objection period running from the 22nd of August to the 23rd September. Only one objection was received within the 21 day period. There were no late objections. Miss Batten and Miss Lloyd, sorry, Mr. Batten and then Miss Lloyd submitted a joint uh, objection, which was detailed in Appendix C of the report. Uh, and I'll run through the, the basis of the objection um, just now. Initially, well, the, the first item that they raised was a statement of reasons, um, reciting that the draft order is not in the interest of casualty reduction, nor is it to improve vulnerable road users. I would say that the 20 mile an hour speed limit is required to achieve the safety standards for the active travel scheme. 40 mile an hour speed limits is to provide a buffer, if you like, between the 20s and the national speed limit of 60 mile an hour. And the active travel scheme's objectives are to include encouraging children to walk and cycle within the village and also to reduce the speed limit. Oh, sorry, reducing the speed limit uh, also reduces the risk and the severity of accidents. Um, the second point on the objection. Uh, noted that the draft order was not supported by accident data. Um, we wouldn't normally validate uh, a statement of reasons. Um, the third point was um, a comment that um, uh, speed versus situational awareness. Um, drivers are more aware at 30 miles per hour than 20 miles per hour 
and uh, it was inferred that this increases the risk of accidents. I would say that there was a report published in 2007 by the British Medical Journal, uh, which detailed significant reductions in the serious and fatal accidents. Uh, and again, that's uh, I went into that in depth in my report. Um, the, the objection continued by uh, talking about um, the reduced speed limit over an extended semi-urban area can be challenging to motorists. Um, to which I would uh, suggest that uh, the active travel scheme is intended to try to join up the different areas of Kilbilke and includes um, traffic calming measures to help change drivers' perceptions of speed so that um, the speed is more consistent uh, throughout the village. Um, risks to cyclists was also mentioned um, especially when vehicles were overtaking cyclists. Um, the, it was then suggested that um, the risk to cyclists was compounded by the traffic calming measures and that it doesn't comply with the highway code, especially in relation to the hierarchy of road users. Taking these in turn, I would say that um, the motorist should only overtake when safe to do so, and it's the driver who has to make that decision. Um, with regards to the risk to cyclists being compounded by the traffic calming measures, the traffic calming measures are there to reduce vehicle speeds uh, so that it complies with the safety standards. And as I've already cited, the British Medical Journal report noting the significant reduction in the numbers and the severity of accidents involving vehicles and pedestrians and cyclists. Um, in terms of that it doesn't comply with the highway code, and especially the hierarchy of road users, I don't accept this. Highway code rule 204 states that pedestrians and cyclists, etc., are at the top of the hierarchy with motorists at the bottom. And I would suggest that the uh, both the active travel scheme and the proposed speed limits are intended and fully comply with the idea that pedestrians and cyclists are at the top of the hierarchy with motorists at the bottom. And such that the proposed speed limits are consistent with rule 204 of the highway code. Um, further point of the, object, of the objection was that the speed limits don't apply to cyclists. That is true, the cyclists don't uh, well, speed limits don't comply, uh, don't apply to cyclists. Um, with the, uh, the objection was then developed in the sense that uh, cyclists could potentially overtake vehicles doing 20 miles an hour. That is possible, but um, typical cyclists speeds range from about eight to 24 miles per hour for a one hour cycle ride. Um, this is dependent on the ability and experience. Um, and although cyclists might overtake a vehicle at 20, um, I think that um, the, the, we've got to consider the risks of um, and the benefits reducing the number of accidents and the severity of accidents by uh, implementing the 20 mile an hour cycle, uh, 20 mile an hour speed limit. Uh, street lighting was also uh, raised as an objection with um, uh, some sections of road being 20 miles an hour and not having street lighting. There is no requirement to light 20 mile an hour roads. Um, further uh, item on the objection was automatic high beam technology, which is a sensor on modern cars, which automatically switches between your main beam and dipped headlights. And I understand that uh, this function uh, is only activated at a certain speed, which I believe from the objection is above the 20 mile an hour speed limit. The inference being that if you are below 20, then your automatic high beam doesn't switch between high and dipped beams. There's 
the objection then went on to say that there was no street lighting, uh, which compounded the issue. My response to that would be that it's the driver's responsibility to adjust the headlights in their car as appropriate. Um, within the objection, uh, it listed a number of different makes, um, all of cars, all containing uh, automatic high beam technology. I uh, checked on the internet and all of the makes um, listed have instructions on how to change or how to switch the automatic high beam function on or off. So again, I think it's the driver's responsibility. Vehicle emissions were also cited as part of the objection. Um, uh, with uh, Mr. Batten and Miss Lloyd not convinced that 20 mile an hour speed limits benefits air quality, as uh, essentially that uh, engines work harder at, uh, at lower speeds. There was a report by the Imperial College, uh, which uh, looked at the different types of vehicles, uh, engine size, and the fuel used. It's not a straightforward uh, picture, but in summary, the report noted that it would be incorrect to assume that 20 mile an hour speed limits adversely impacts air quality. Uh, I've detailed uh, in my uh, my report um, uh, exactly how that um, statement was considered. Enforcement speed was also raised as an issue. Um, lack of enforcement means that 20 mile an hour speed limit won't be observed. I would say that um, whilst this isn't strictly part of the speed limit um, objection, uh, the um, traffic calming measures are included in the active travel scheme. These measures will help change drivers' perceptions of a safe speed and help to bring speeds down. But ultimately, the enforcement is First Police Scotland. And uh, finally, signage. Um, there was two issues here. One was the 20 mile an hour repeater signage um, and also 20 mile an hour signs at cul-de-sacs to ensure that visitors know it's a 20 mile an hour limit on the main road. I would say that uh, the the speed limit uh, report and the draft orders do not detail the signage required for the speed limits. That would come after the, uh, the, uh, the draft orders are approved. All the signage has to be designed in accordance with the current regulations to ensure we have a consistent approach. So I've I've given a, a brief summary of the objections um, just now. My report contains a detailed response, and um, uh, I would be pleased to take any questions um, from the councillors. Uh, and following that, I would maybe ask the councillors to determine if the objection is upheld or rejected. Thank you. Okay, have, have we got any questions for Ian? on the, the proposed speed limit change. Um, I'd just like to say, Ian, thank you so much. The report is it's incredibly detailed. An enormous amount of work has gone into responding to, I mean, every, every item. It, I mean, the, it, the detail is just tremendous, actually. Um, I personally, I can't see. I, I mean, I know it's difficult to drive at twenty to, to change your habit of because my lock is now twenty miles an hour. I know it's difficult as a driver to change your habit of driving at twenty miles an hour, but that's a that's a minor inconvenience to the benefit that um, driving more slowly through through villages has for village communities. So um, I. I fully support. I mean, I fully support the change in with the speed limit. It makes complete sense to be forty 
So you're coming out off 60, 40 because it gets your head in the right place. Designing the road so you, you know, you design with traffic calming measures makes you slow down. But it's we are the ones that have to alter our behaviour and our mentality to how we drive through villages. So I I cannot see how anybody would object. And I have to pay tribute to the community council, Karen Tosh, and the work and effort that's gone in and to the community who overwhelmingly seem to me to be supportive of this change of speed limit and the and then the active travel scheme as well. So so no questions, just wanted just to say that and thank you for the report. Thank you. No, thank you, Sarah. Yeah, I would wholeheartedly echo everything that Sarah's just said. I I think the, the level of detail in the report is is astounding and very thorough and yes just goes to show what uh, a fully comprehensive piece of work this is and the amount of work that you've put into it is brilliant so thank you very much i would also agree that the community um i to, to be blunt i was in koboki this morning just before nine o'clock this morning and it was a very good reminder of just how many small children are walking, cycling, scooting to Koboki Primary. You know, it's, it's a school with a very low amount of children who are transported in. Most children are making their way to Koboki Primary on foot, on bike, on scoot. Um, and, a, and a large amount of parents who are, are out walking with them in the morning. And I think when you know statistically the difference that, you know, accidents at 20 miles an hour and accidents at 30 miles an hour, an hour make to small children and the, where their heads are in relation to cars and how close they are to traffic, I can see exactly why the community is behind this change and the, the whole speed limit change and the active travel route. So I have no concerns at all and um you know it will be my opinion that i'd like to see this um speed limit change happen um marvin may do you have any comment yeah i just wanted to thank you for the immense amount of work that's gone into this and um, both the community council and yourself and it's just absolutely phenomenal and i completely agree with everything that sarah and Lindsay have said um, and very much in support of this going ahead thank you so are, are we all in agreement that um, we are not taking the objection and we're going with the speed limit change? Yes. Yes. Great. No, okay. again, thank you so much, Ian. No, thank you. Brilliant. OK, and then the last item on our agenda then is to approve the, the previous minutes, I think. Um, so I, I take it nobody had any problems with them. They were very short and concise. I just want to ask one question. Oh, uh, sorry. <laughs> oh, and Jane has as well. Jane, you go first. Your membership, just to um, highlight, those minutes had been approved at council, so that you, it's for noting. Oh, have they? Oh, for noting. noting. Sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. No, noted. It was a question I can ask. It's not for the, it doesn't have to be for this meeting. Don't worry. And Jean, I, I, John, is your hand still? My hand's still up. I can't even, I'm trying to. That's it. okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so that takes us to the end of our meeting. So um, uh, thank you very much for, for everybody's input and time today. I really appreciate it.